When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Good evening, kitties. It is I, your host, Mr. Whiskers, the Mad Catter, here to bring you another episode of Twisted Tea Time. For tonight's tea, I am drinking green tea. What can I say? I have a hangover. Would you like to know how you can support the podcast and without spending a dime either? Well, you see, this is a young show and I have grand plans for it and others like it. But I need Twisted Tea Time to become successful before I consider branching out. Now, there are many ways a podcast can make money, and some of them don't even require me to bear a hairy ankle on some street corner or another. But those methods do not matter at this time. Right now, what I need are more listeners. So, folks, those listening on RenegadeRadio.com or my listeners on SoundCloud, If you can spare a moment, hop on over to Stitcher Radio, Google Play, iTunes, or even TuneIn Radio, and give this little horror show a positive review. The better reviews, the more people who might come and listen. The more listeners, the easier it is to spread that audio plague that turns people into murderous zombies. Um, I mean, the more listeners, the more people I can tell stories to. Yes, that is exactly what I meant. (coughs) Hairball. Anyhow, if you wish to help... Just look up Twisted Tea Time on one of those aforementioned sites and provide a positive review. Hell, if it's legible, I might even read it to the listeners out there in podcast land. Apparently, that's a thing some shows do. Now, I have rambled on long enough. I do believe it is time to get on to our stories. Now. I actually said now instead of meow. Go figure. (laughs) Uh, A constant theme in horror stories is its very core. And that is quite simply fear. You mortals are afraid of many things. Clowns, the dentist, heights... And you give them great names as well. Cholrophobia, odontophobia, acrophobia. The list goes on. Because these themes are so pervasive, so essential, I'll be exploring them often. Oh, sure. Every episode of Twisted Tea Time could be described as delving into the nature of fear. But these episodes will be labeled Nothing to Fear but Fear Itself. And we'll have a particular focus on phobias. So for tonight's episode, I have two rather common fears to delve into. The first one is one my host body had when he was but a wee toddling sack of flesh. And while he got better, Let's just say this particular fear could easily return. 
especially if he found the source of that damn buzzing sound. That Damn Buzzing Sound by Ariel Lowe. Over the past month, I've been hearing this intermittent buzzing sound. At first I thought I'd be able to tune it out, but it just became more obnoxious over time. It transformed into a constant, vibrating noise in the back of my head. It was difficult to focus on anything. It became so bad that I had trouble sleeping, and it's beyond me how my parents never noticed it. You know what they say, though. You lose hearing with age, so I wasn't surprised when they gave me confused looks. Tyler, my neighbor, heard it too, and I was relieved at that. It meant I wasn't going crazy. He's actually the one that brought it up when we were in my bedroom playing video games. So with him at my side, I was determined to find the source of this noise. We searched my house first, and placed our ears all over the walls. The buzzing sound never seemed to become stronger or weaker, so, so we checked outside. My original thought was that something was wrong with the air conditioning unit. If I was right, it would explain why the sound transferred throughout the entire house. But my theory was wrong. We stood beside the thrumming unit, watching the gigantic fans spin around inside. The unit was vibrating but it wasn't the sound we were looking for. However, we realized the sound was louder outside than it had been in my room. We searched my backyard up and down and stopped at the wooden fence surrounding my yard. We placed our ears to the fence and exchanged a knowing stare. The sound was coming from beyond the fence, and that was enough for both of us. We climbed the fence and dropped easily to the other side. The area beyond my backyard was filled with untouched forest. I had been over my fence a few times when I accidentally kicked a soccer ball over, but not often enough times to explore. My parents always complained about there being poison ivy everywhere, and there was. We skirted around it and created a path without a problem. It was really bizarre, though. All we could hear was this buzzing sound. Nothing else. I mean, we could just barely hear the leaves and sticks cracking beneath our feet and all other sounds seemed absent. There weren't even birds singing. As we kept walking, the buzzing sound grew louder, and eventually we couldn't see my fence anymore. We stopped several yards from a cluster of trees covered in tumor-like growths. We just stood there staring at it, and n neither of us could explain what they were. They appeared like they were a part of the tree as if the bark had bubbled outward in these strange formations. Trees can naturally develop deformed growths called burls, something I learned in hindsight. Naturally, though, our first thoughts were to poke it. Both of us were too chicken to get any closer, so we grabbed rocks instead. It only took one toss. Tyler was a baseball player. The rock collided with one of the large growths, and upon contact, the growth exploded outward, which sent chunks flying. Not even seconds later, bees, thousands of bees swarmed out of the opening and formed into a thick, throbbing mass. Both of us screamed and ran. I had never run faster in my entire life. The bees were hot on our heels, and I felt their stingers plunging into my arms, my back, and my legs. I don't remember hopping the fence or how I arrived in my front yard, but I must have been screaming bloody murder. I stripped down to my underwear, and my mom began spraying me and the persistent bees with the garden hose. And the icy pressurized water didn't hurt as bad as the welts that formed instantly. I was ushered into the kitchen and my mom began meticulously removing the stingers with a pair of tweezers. She lost count of how many she removed from my body. I was only allowed to change into dry underwear since the stings needed to be iced. The swelling and welts had been unimaginable, and now I understood how people can die from bee stings. I was forced onto the couch with ice packs positioned all over my body. 
The majority of the stings were on my back, so I laid on my stomach and must have passed out some time later. I woke the next day in the same position, and the ice packs had been removed. My mom refused to let me change into comfortable clothing until she inspected all of the welts. Thankfully, the swelling had reduced significantly since the previous day. Over a bowl of soup, I learned that my parents called an exterminator after the incident. Apparently, there had been bees angrily flying around our yard and some of the neighbors' yards. By that point, everyone on our street could hear the enraged buzzing. The exterminator arrived promptly and followed the trail of chaotic bees back to the nest. The man actually told my parents that it had been the largest colony he had ever seen. He sprayed so many chemicals that he didn't want anyone near the area. <laughs> Not that anyone wanted to go investigate for themselves. The whole situation made me feel like a complete idiot. How could we have been so stupid? My only consolation was that Tyler might have suffered just as bad as me from the bee stings. I brought this up to my parents and asked how bad his injuries were. My mother gave me this petrified expression that I'll never forget. There had been nobody behind me when I raced around the side of my house. She hadn't even been aware that Tyler had gone back there with me. I felt guilty. Beyond guilty. Horrible images of Tyler being swarmed consumed me. I, I swore that he had been right beside me. What made me feel worse is that the exterminator never saw anyone. If Tyler had fallen behind, the exterminator would have known because he searched the entire area for nests. About a week after the incident, Tyler was still missing. I decided to search the area for myself, but I wasn't going unprepared. I grabbed a can of my mother's hairspray along with a lighter from the kitchen. If any of these bees were still kicking, then I wanted protection. I hopped the fence and moved slowly through the forest, my right hand clenched tightly on the hairspray. The distance to the nest was much further than I remembered. I knew that I had arrived when I heard a thick crunch beneath my shoes. I glanced down and felt a shiver rush through my body. The entire ground was layered with bee corpses. I couldn't see the dirt or grass, and in some areas the bees just piled on top of each other. I was on my last nerve when I approached the nests, trying my best to ignore the sickening crunches underfoot. I narrowed my eyes at the nest that we destroyed, and when I rounded the tree, the rest of the nests became apparent nearly ten times larger. I cautiously nudged one of the nests, which crumbled and revealed thick wax and honeycomb. Dead bees trapped inside of the nest oozed through the opening, and it was enough to turn my stomach. I grumbled beneath my breath and began poking the nest with more confidence, watching more of the pieces fall to the ground. That's when I heard the buzzing return. My heart skipped several beats and I stumbled backwards and almost landed in the disgusting ruin of dead bees. I sprinted back several feet and raised the hairspray and the lighter, watching the nests from all angles. These bees could appear from anywhere. They must have formed their nests throughout this cluster of trees, and it was very possible that their nests extended into the ground and beneath the roots. I bit my lip and waited for the swarm to appear like last time but it never did. Instead, an odd and disturbing sight took me by surprise. I left the clearing filled with dead bees and stepped through several bushes, trying to confirm what I was seeing. My whole body quivered, and I wanted to call out. My voice failed me, though, and it might have saved my life. Not even ten yards from me was Tyler. He was just standing there with his back facing me, and something was wrong. His movements were off. His body was twitching involuntarily. And when he took a step, his posture was rigid, while his arms were locked in janky positions. Despite the horrible feeling in my gut, I wanted to call out to him. My concern quickly transformed into fear. Tyler turned and lolled his head to the side as if his neck were broken. 
he knew I was there, yet he couldn't see me. His eyes were gone. Two dark sockets stared back at me with bees crawling out of them. Sores layered his flesh, which had turned into gaping holes, and a viscous fluid was running down his chin. I was too scared to move. I only ran when Tyler began lumbering toward me, swaying back and forth and twitching. For the second time, I screamed and ran for the hills, trying to outrun the crashes coming from behind me. When I scrambled over the fence, I felt wood scraping my skin, but I didn't care. I pounded on the back door crazily and slammed it shut once my mother let me inside. She didn't understand much of what I was saying since I was hysterical, but she gathered that I had found Tyler's body in the woods. By the time the police arrived, they waited for me to calm down so I could explain what I saw. I was a mess, and they must have thought I was nuts. They searched in the area where I saw Tyler, but they didn't find him. They found his body yards upon yards away by a creek. Tyler had been reclined on his knees with his forehead against the ground, immobile and dead. I refused to ID him. I, I, I couldn't see those empty eye sockets again. When I recovered from the event, I wanted to know what happened. I emailed the pathologist who performed Tyler's autopsy and practically begged for answers. I needed a logical explanation for what I saw. He explained how they were going through routine procedure when they hit a minor roadblock. When they sliced Tyler open, dead bees poured out. His body had been literally bloated with bees. His eyes were missing. His jaw was broken, completely unhinged. His teeth were gone along with his tongue, which was replaced with wax. The worst part was this. His organs were gone. All that was left was the skeleton, muscles, and tissues, which seemed to be the base for the extreme amounts of honeycomb within his chest cavity. The pathologist's only theory was that the bees devoured his organs. But bees aren't carnivores. Welcome back, kitties! It seems our protagonist's friend failed to take note of the number one rule of survival. You don't have to run faster than the angry swarm of flesh-eating bees. You just have to run faster than the person next to you. <laughs> <sighs> now, as horrific as a swarm of flesh-eating bees might be, especially ones that nest within your body after they devour your innards, I do find I'm quite curious as to what soil and honey tastes like. <laughs> I wonder if it would make this green tea taste like something palatable. Not like green tea is terrible. I actually rather like green tea. I just happen to pick up some uh, terrible green tea. Perhaps whiskey would make it better. I find whiskey makes everything better. Fun fact, kitties, melisophobia, also known as apophobia, if you want to be some cretin that combines Latin and Greek terms, fucking heathens, is the fear of bees. So now you can say that you actually learned something on this show. Moving on. Now for our next story... We explore a fear that is well known to many of you. 
Perhaps you got caught in a crawl space. Maybe you were locked in a closet. Or it might be that you dread the lack of mobility that comes from hiding under the bed, waiting for some pitiful child to dangle their fingers and toes over the edge for you to snatch. Well, either way, fear of enclosed spaces is quite prominent. But what happens if you don't put yourself in tight little boxes, cramped little alcoves, or if you don't even get squeezed in constricting jackets that force you to hug yourself all day long? What happens when you're actually in a nice open space, like your apartment or your house? and you feel that it is squeezing in on you, shrinking down on you, day by day. Because that doesn't seem like a normal flavor of claustrophobia. Claustrophobia by Moonlit Cove Things have simply not been the same for Dalton Whitworth since the carriage accident. Colors are not as vivid, music not nearly as pleasurable. Every meal he consumes is bland and leaves an unsavory aftertaste. Days filled with sunlight are no longer warm, enjoyable experiences. On the contrary, he finds the light to be oppressive, causing his eyes, head, and neck to be in a constant state of discomfort and torment. Dalton had previously enjoyed these simple pleasures in his life, as recently as last month, until the accident that took his beloved Rachel. Now he feels as if he spends all his effort avoiding everything. He dreads having to eat yet another tasteless dinner. He stays indoors as much as possible, only daring to venture out long enough to acquire the necessities for survival. He goes out of his way to avoid human contact, even though his circle of acquaintances showed great care and sympathy for him upon the loss of his wife, he would much prefer to be left alone now. If by chance he did encounter a familiar face in public, he knew the conversation would inevitably turn toward his tragic experience forcing him to relive the nightmare. He would again see in his mind the spooked horse on its hind legs, the carriage jolting harshly, Rachel letting out the briefest of screams as she is thrown from her seated position atop the open-air coach, the cobblestone pavement, the blood pooling under her lifeless form, his helpless inability to alter the outcome. Dalton cannot bear these images any longer, and he is frightened of closing his eyes for fear of being accosted once again by these horrific visions. He passes the days in his apartment reading by dim gaslight anything he can get his hands on. Novels, textbooks, newspapers, and other periodicals, packaging for common household products, anything that will help him escape. When he is not reading, he extinguishes the gaslight and sits in his armchair near the only window in his tiny quarters. He pulls back the heavy, dense curtain just enough for one eye to ingest the world outside. He is careful not to allow an overabundance of sunlight into the dark room. People outside go about their happy lives, content and oblivious to the dark matters that one who has suffered a loss must endure. On one particular morning when Dalton awoke, he was immediately confronted with an odd sensation. Something wasn't quite right. He was in the habit of standing at the foot of his bed every morning and facing the mirror as he dressed. He did so this day as well, but with the exception that the image being reflected did not appear as it had on other days. He wasn't able to pinpoint its inaccuracy until he attempted to button his jacket. The same jacket he wore most days. This day, the button second from the top was no longer visible in his reflection. 
This had never been the case before, and Dalton was uncertain of how such a discrepancy might have occurred. Have I grown shorter overnight? Has the mirror been raised on the wall? Nonsense. These options were impossible. All throughout the day, as Dalton made his way around the apartment, his rhythm seemed to be off. After years of living in the same rooms, amongst the same unmoved furnishings, one develops a sense of rhythm to their comings and goings. Eight steps to the armchair, five more to the front door, a slight inward turn of the left foot while entering the bedroom, lest one's toe be stubbed on the protruding dresser again. These are all subconscious, of course. There is no actual counting or calculation involved. But the human mind takes note of these nuances internally and builds its own map of the landscape. Movements are subliminally adjusted to achieve the utmost efficiency, to the point where it is possible to flawlessly navigate the surroundings even in complete darkness. Dalton was not in complete darkness. And yet he continued to stumble throughout the day. The sides of his shoes bumped corners of walls. He approached the bookshelf from his armchair in seven steps instead of eight. His top hat grazed the overhead gas lamp in the main hallway. At dinner, he slid his chair out from under the table to the point that it was touching the wall, and yet he was barely able to squeeze himself between the table and chair in order to sit for his meal. Later that night, after he finished his reading in the dim light, he reached up to extinguish the lamp and clumsily jammed his finger against the brass fixture. It hadn't been so close last night, he thought while rubbing the pain away. Sleep did not come easily that night. Dalton tossed and turned in a feverish heat of sounds and images in his mind. The horse neighing loudly as it bolted away, Rachel helplessly tumbling from the side of the accelerating carriage, Dalton lying next to her on the ground, calling her name, trying to rouse her, fighting his tears. The following morning, Dalton noted his red eyes and the dark circles underneath them as he dressed in the mirror. However, this was not the only startling revelation. As he buttoned his coat, he also noticed that the top button was no longer visible in the viewing pane. A rush of adrenaline flowed through his body, leaving him with a brief pain in his chest and a sweat beginning to emerge on his brow. He took a step backward, but it was not enough to bring the button into view. One more step backward and he stumbled against the foot rail of his bed. This can't be. Am I going mad? He pondered. He became light-headed and was overwhelmed with the urge to sit. He made his way down the hall to the armchair and fell into its velvety comfort. After a time of rest and catching his bearings, Dalton proceeded to the bookshelf. He, he could have sworn it only took six steps this time to peruse for an item to read. Once he selected a book, he settled into the chair once more to immerse himself in a world far from his own. Dalton awoke abruptly. He had no idea how long he had slumbered in his reading chair. The remaining light in his apartment was dim, and one quick glance behind the thick curtain revealed a deep indigo dusk sky. To his astonishment, Dalton realized that he'd passed the bulk of the daylight hours unconscious. He had even forgotten that he had been reading until he found the book face down on the floor next to the armchair. He arose from the chair and stumbled a bit, still unstable from his lengthy nap. Upon making his way to the bedroom, he nearly ran full steam into the wall at the end of the hallway. He had reached the end a full three paces sooner than before. Suddenly he felt fully awake, his annoyance at this scenario having grown to its peak. He decided to investigate further to prove once and for all that he wasn't going completely stark raving mad. He retrieved a broomstick and laid it on the hallway floor with its end touching the wall. He marked the other end with his finger pressed tightly against the floor and then slid the stick forward until it aligned with his marked finger. Repeating this process all down the corridor, he determined that it took six full lengths of the broomstick with a remaining space of about ten inches that last portion he estimated in his mind, 
to reach the front door. He noted this dimension on the inside cover of the book he'd picked up off the floor, and vowed to measure again soon. Before going to bed that evening, Dalton paused to have a look at his reflection in the mirror once more. He stood with the back of his calves touching the footboard of the bed. He almost broke down into tears when he saw the sickly man in the reflection, a shadow of the man he was before losing Rachel. Aside from his startling visage, he also took note of the truncated image. Now his face was only visible down to the chin, no neckline, no buttons on his coat. He reached his arms out before him and was able to touch the wall with his fingertips, something never before possible as the wall had always been a good seven feet away from the foot of his bed. Defeated, he hung his head, removed his outer clothing, and crawled into bed, hoping to sleep indefinitely, not minding if he never woke again. But awaken he did. He had slept soundly all night long, only stirring momentarily when thoughts of the accident attempted to encroach on his dreams. It was morning light now, and the first thing that Dalton noticed was something pressing against his bare foot. Still in a fog, he bent his already stiff neck downward to catch a glimpse of what it was that had come into contact with him. A swell of panic and fear overtook him when he determined that it was the wall with the mirror on it pressed all the way up against the foot rail of his bed. Dalton jolted his neck the opposite way to see the space behind the headboard. It was still snugly against the opposing wall. His heart raced with dread at this unexplainable event. His mind did not know how to process this information. He exited the bed on the left side and squeezed past the pressing walls and through the doorway into the hall. After retrieving the measuring broomstick, he employed it to measure the hallway a second time. His hands shook, but he was careful to line up the stick accurately at each interval. Upon reaching the front door, he nearly fainted to find that he'd only counted four and a half lengths of the stick. What is happening to me? He cried out to no one as he collapsed on the floor. He sobbed openly, not only because of the strange predicament, but also for his current condition, and for Rachel who had brought such peace and contentment to his life just one month prior. Oh, how things could change so quickly. After regaining his composure, Dalton was overwhelmed with the desire to flee, to get out of that oppressing apartment, even if only temporarily. As much as the idea frightened him, he decided to pass the daylight hours indoors. Where exactly he would go, he did not yet know. He picked himself up off the floor, found his hat and overcoat, and made his way to the front door, noting how it took fewer steps to approach it. Dalton walked along the cobblestone path through town. He stared at the ground as he walked, hoping that no one would try to speak to him or even make eye contact. No one did. Turning the corner near a leather tanning shop, he had to divert his path as the store owner came bursting out of the front door of the shop and threw a bucket of wastewater into the street, nearly wetting Dalton's shoes. How completely rude and insensitive, Dalton thought though he did not speak to the man. He continued on toward an area free of businesses, buildings, and the commotion of life. A park-like area with benches, a pond, and trees displaying their colorful autumn foliage. Dalton sat on the nearest park bench upon entering the clearing. It was relatively calm and peaceful since it was mid-morning on a weekday. The only other patrons were a mother feeding ducks in the pond with her toddler son, an elderly gentleman sitting on a bench opposite Dalton reading a newspaper, and the occasional passerby on their way to more important things. Dalton sat and observed until he felt his eyelids getting heavy. The breeze and the silence lulled him. The cloud cover was a thick gray blanket preventing any harsh sunlight, much to Dalton's delight. Even so, it was unseasonably warm, which only furthered his sleepiness. As he was on the verge of crossing the threshold into dream territory, he saw a woman in a pink dress pass by in front of him. He was startled, 
and followed her with his eyes as she approached the pond. Jolting to full alertness, Dalton's heart began to pound as his mind guided him toward the inevitable thought. My God! She looks just like Rachel! He could feel his pulse throbbing in his neck. He stood and slowly approached the woman from behind. When he was standing just adjacent to her, he mustered the courage to speak. Er, Rachel? He asked in almost a whisper, his voice weak and quivering. The woman turned and looked him directly in the eye. Oh, it's her! By God, it's her! He thought. Dalton! Her voice was filled with relief and longing, as if the wife of a military man being reunited with her husband after long months apart. They immediately embraced. Rachel's head pressed tightly into Dalton's shoulder. They both wept. Dalton pressed the confusion in his mind of how this could be possible. It didn't matter to him. His precious wife had returned to him, and he wanted to revel in the fact, plausibility be damned. The longer the embrace lingered, the more Dalton noticed the heaviness of Rachel leaning on him, the slackness of her body. Soon it felt to Dalton as if he were supporting her entire weight. She had gone completely limp in his arms. Still holding the embrace, they collapsed to the ground together, Dalton attempting to ease his wife's descent. It wasn't until they reached the ground that her head fell away from his shoulder, revealing the truth. Dalton recoiled in horror upon seeing the decaying face of his once lovely bride. Her eye sockets were sunken and deep, her jaw slacked open to an impossibly wide angle. Her complexion was gray and flecked with dry, cracked areas. Her hair, previously beautiful and one of Dalton's favorite features about her, was now thin and stringy, matted to the shape of her head. Rachel's lifeless body fell away onto the stone walkway as Dalton pulled his arms away in disgust. He felt the pain of losing her all over again, fresh as the day it first happened. Dalton jolted awake to find himself still sitting on the park bench. He nervously looked around to see if anyone had noticed his startled awakening. He hoped he had not screamed out in his sleep. He was relieved to find that there was no one around. The woman with her young boy? Gone. The old man reading the paper? Gone. The sky was now a much darker shade of gray. The clouds had thickened to the point that it appeared it may rain at any moment. How long had he been sitting there? What felt like minutes could possibly have been hours. As Dalton stood to make his way back to his apartment, the first raindrops began to fall. He was thoroughly soaked as he stood in front of his apartment door and fumbled with the key. In his haste, he dropped it into a puddle then bent over to retrieve it. Once he finally managed the lock, he pushed the door open, but was dumbfounded when it hit a hard object after having only opened a third of the way. He backed the door up a few inches, then pushed again with the same result. Dalton turned sideways and stuck his head and right shoulder into the dark foyer in an attempt to observe the obstruction. Pressed up firmly against the door was his favorite velvety armchair. This is madness, he said aloud, still standing in the soaking deluge. He took several steps back out into the street. The building appeared no different on the outside. He returned to the doorway and pushed hard enough to slide the chair a small amount, just enough to squeeze through and into his apartment. What he found was completely astonishing. The size of the space inside had diminished to the point that the furniture was gathering in the center of the room, walls pressing in on all sides. He'd had to remove his hat and crouch down lest his head hit the ceiling. There was no need for Dalton to measure in order to confirm his suspicions. The room was so small now that he could not even walk through it without stepping over furnishings that had once been placed feet apart from one another. The hallway was practically non-existent, and he reached his bedroom in only three steps, turning sideways to squeeze between the walls. 
The hallway was practically non-existent, and he reached his bedroom in only three steps, turning sideways to squeeze between its walls. He had to step up onto his bed as he crossed the threshold into the room. The walls touched the bed on all sides, and the mirror had fallen onto the foot of his bed, face down. Dalton sat on his bed and turned the mirror over. He did not recognize the man staring back at him, pale, gaunt, sickly, haunted. Not knowing what else to do, he lay on his bed and waited. Waited for what? He didn't know exactly. For the walls to consume him, he supposed. For the ceiling to drop down and crush the last breath from his lungs. He was ready. He was resigned. There was rumbling when the walls and ceiling shifted again. This was the first time Dalton had witnessed the movement himself. It was alarming at first, but he knew it was inevitable. He accepted the dust that flaked onto his face as the ceiling dropped inches more. He welcomed it, even. The head and footboards of his bed cracked and splintered as they buckled under the pressure from the wall on either side. The gaslight fixture mounted on the ceiling touched the mattress next to him. He held the mirror flat against his chest. There was no longer room enough to stand it upright. More rumbling. The mattress bent and formed a tomb around Dalton. He closed his eyes and waited. He waited until he lost consciousness and all was black. Dalton's eyes slowly opened. He was enveloped in complete darkness. He felt groggy and his head was pounding. It took several minutes for him to come out of the fog, but once he did, it was as if he hadn't felt this clear-minded in quite some time. He was alive. Not only that, but he wanted to live. He felt the energy of revitalized life flowing through him. Memories came rushing back. In his mind's eye, he saw a lovely day with Rachel. He saw them mounting the carriage together after their evening meal at DuPont's Bistro. He saw the spooked horse rear up. He remembered the severe jolting of the carriage. He saw his wife plummeting to the ground. He saw himself also falling harshly onto the pavement stones, his head slamming against them violently. Everything after that was blackness. Dalton was barely able to move. When he finally regained a small amount of control over his limbs, he felt around for his surroundings. He was lying on his back, on something plush and soft. His hands found the edges of his confines quickly. There were soft, satin-like walls up against his shoulders and inches from his face. The ceiling directly in front of him felt as if it had an arched shape to it. Awakening further, he determined that he could not move his body beyond this position as he was lying in a depression that fit snugly against him. The air was thick and musty, barely breathable. It hurt his lungs to inhale it too deeply. Sweat formed on his brow as he realized the full extent of his environment. Panic set in. No! he yelled, using up some of the remaining stale air inside. I'm not dead! He banged his fist against the lid as best he could within the limited space, but it only created a muffled thud on the soft interior. Dalton screamed and began sobbing. When he tried to take more air into his lungs, it felt like someone had placed a pillow over his face. He labored to inhale again. Approximately six feet above him was a marker which bore two names. Rachel A. Whitworth on the left side and Dalton G. Whitworth on the right side. Before each was inscribed a date of birth and a date of death. The dates of death being identical. In between the names was chiseled into the stone. Together in life. Together in death.
Two days after the burial, two lone mourners, co-workers of Dalton's, visited the gravesite to place flowers. They stood in their top hats and overcoats, staring solemnly at the headstone. It's a shame he didn't recover from his coma, one grieving man said to the other. Indeed, the second man responded. I do wonder, though, said the first co-worker. Do you suppose someone in that state knows? I mean, are they capable of thinking or dreaming? After some thought, the second man dismissed the idea. Eh, I doubt it. But Dalton Whitworth, if he were here today, would beg to differ. Yes, he would say. We are capable of thinking and dreaming. And it is as vivid as life itself. Welcome back, kitties. And it appears Dalton Whitworth was in a bit too deep. <laughs> Had his family invested in a safety coffin, he might have been saved by the bell. <laughs> alas, alack, one could even say he was caught breathless in the end. Perhaps they should have thrown him awake. <laughs> I hope these puns are positively petrifying to you. <laughs> Fun fact, kitties. Taphophobia is the fear of being buried alive. And I imagine those with claustrophobia would find taphophobia not far behind on their list of fears. <laughs> no kitties. If I haven't scared you off already, I'm going to tell you how you can further support this delightful, pun-filled show. Of course, there are the ratings, the reviews, but the fact of the matter is, this cat needs cream, and cream costs money. So I shall perform this labor of love for as long as I can, but a little extra cash never hurts. Especially if it went into production values, commissioning art, licensing music, purchasing sound effects. Uh, this show costs money. Web space, advertising, uh, eventually I would even like to get merchandise. And the less I pay out of pocket, the better. Especially considering my host body's income leaves much to be desired. Let's just say his day job isn't very impressive. Now, how might you help, you ask? Because I know you're positively curious about that. Well, eventually I'll involve affiliates and that sort of thing, but I honestly feel the best route is a little service called Patreon. For a small subscription fee of a dollar a month. That's a dollar a month! You can get a number of perks. You can get even more perks if you subscribe with more money a month. I, I'll figure those perks out, but they're there. They will be there. Uh, but until then, these perks will consist of things like remastered versions of past stories 
where I actually take these stories and I apply more sound effects, more music, things like that to make them more of an audio production. But beyond that, you will also be able to get access to live showings that I will be performing once a month. Just live little readings of various short stories. And I'll even provide the MP3s for subscribers to download. That sort of thing. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it's what I can offer at this point in time. So if you are interested in helping this show expand, then please look me up on Patreon at patreon.com slash themadcatter for a list of perks. Oh, and there are also gold. If I reach a certain amount of people, I, I've got to figure that out myself. I'm, I'm, I'm a little behind. I'm not really sure what numbers I should be looking at, honestly. I'll just have to go and investigate. But if I get a certain number of people subscribing a month, then I can buy better equipment. I can buy better software design programs, and and I can even get rights to professionally designed sound effects and commissioned music. Ah, so many possibilities. There's even another show I would like to start putting out every week, or every other week. That one might require a little bit of work, so I'm thinking every other week. <sighs> anyway, kitties, I have rambled on long enough. Alas, my friends, the time has come. I do believe our stories are done. I am afraid I must depart. But do come back and don't lose heart. <laughs> the Mad Catter presents Twisted D Time is copyright 2016 by ZP Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained either via direct permission or the Creative Commons license. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. You can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com. Details can be found in the show notes. If you want more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on facebook.com slash Cheshire Hat or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. Download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Cheshire Hat or visit me at www.themadcatter.net. Good night, kitties. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>